On today's video, we're going to be talking about types of user story. And by the end of the vi this video, hopefully you understand the difference between a spike, an enabler, and a functional user story. Welcome back to Aisha's Come. I'm very happy to have you all join my platform. For my current subscribers and my new subscribers, I welcome you all to the channel. So let's get into the video. So I've been asked a lot of time question about Aisha, what's the difference between enabler and a story? What's the difference between a functional story and a spike? Uh, I know in my last video, I went over a different technique on how to split user story. And if you all recall, in the spider technique, uh, the S stands for spike. So the spike is the number one type I have here as a type of a user story that a scrum team will sometimes will need to get them to know uh, what they will be working on. So the spike is basically when a team decides to work in a spike, is maybe they are working in a future that they are not familiar with. And they try to gain more insights or have different assumptions and tests and use like a sprint in that particular spike. And, and it's very important if a team is creating a spike or is working on a spike, uh, it's something that's been discussed around with the team. Then this can happen maybe in the backlog refinement or sprint planning where you always discuss that before you actually create a functional story where it can actually show value at the end of that delivery of that functional story uh, due to the team not feeling comfortable or confident in completing that, they want to first do little research and analysis to gain more insights, to test more assumptions and see at the end of the analysis, what insight will they gain that can help them create or help build this particular functional story? Write the description on that and also have an acceptance criteria at the end of it based on what they've already assumption. And at the end, they will validate uh, was this right or was it not right? You know, so that's the simple way to define spike. And of course, if you're using Jira, you can also impute that. If you don't have the issue type uh, spike, maybe if your company have that or you don't have that, there's a way you guys can come together and use the story and label it as a spike. Anyhow, it's very important for the team and everyone should know that when you're working on a spike, it actually is spike. And also let the stakeholders and everyone know. So at the end of that session, they will not be expecting something. Because at the end of that, at the end of the spike, the value of that is that it's more knowledge gain, more confidence in doing the work, and also uh, the team on having that mutual understanding. So at the end, there is nothing to uh, demo. Sometimes there might be based on what the uh, the analysis was, but for the most part, there is nothing we handing over to the end user. So that's what we spike. So the next type of, uh, type of user story I have in my board is enablers. So enablers too is one different type of a user story or an issue type we can use uh, as a team. Well, this is actually I've seen for the most part in my own experience is when the team are working on a new application, right? And they try to create uh, the architectural setup. Um, so they need all those architectural setup and they need all those environmental setup before they can actually build the functional story for that. And for the most part, those stories are labeled as enablers. And enablers, that's something too, for the most part, the development team will come together and discuss, and the issue type will be created as, oh, we have to first build this wireframe or build this environmental setup, first have to be done and be completed before we now build our functional user story. And that's like actually uh, simpler. People don't get as more confused with enabler like Spike. Uh, so enabler usually is very simple and direct. And for the most part, it's the development team that work on that. And all of those uh, will have to be in place before the team can actually develop uh, the functional story around that. So the next type we have on the board here is the functional user story, which is the last, which is the most popular and the most common that uh, a lot of teams sometimes even make a mistake uh, of mixing the different type of the issue type uh, where they will basically label everything as functional. Like for example, even, even uh, enabler when in reality is not even a functional story. So for the most part, easy why a lot of people will understand functional user story because it's basically you see the actual delivery of it, you know. So at the end of the uh, sprint, uh, you actually see the uh, the increments that was delivered from that. 
uh, let's say we want to, uh, a customer want to update their site, have a login, they, the customer will be able to create a login, get into the site, and basically all this functionality is able to be act on by the end user. So that's why a lot of people are not always confused with uh, functional story, but functional story, uh, for that to be even be possible, let's say we have a website that needed to be created where customers can go in, able to log in, in and out. The architectural and environmental setup, which is the enablers, first more has to be done before the customer are able to do all this functionality. But it is true, sometimes the customer might not see what's happening in the enabler um, part, which is the environmental setup and all of that, but that's needed for them to be able to do their desired functionality in that site. And the spike part is the research analysis that needed to be done first, for just for the people that are doing the work to better gain insights and test some of the assumption before they actually start the development process. And a lot of times too, sometimes spike is done during POC, like when there's a new project, or we have a lot of new people in the team, they don't understand the, uh, the work, and team may use that time to do a lot of uh, research analysis, trainings, and all of that to better gain insights before they go into developing the, pro the product itself. So that's just the meaning and differences between the spike, uh, the enabler, and the story, which is the functional story. And another analogy, sometimes I give an example, let's say like I have this pen, right? For you to maybe just to make it simple for people to further understand, uh, like how you can even differentiate it. Let's say I have this pen or I'm thinking about uh, uh, um, making a pen or building a pen. And I don't know if I want a little tiny pen that I can write in a paper or I'm trying to be, uh, create a marker where I can write on a wall. We just have an idea of just creating something to write with, right? So that's broad, that's huge, right? So I'm, of course, through for that conversation with the team and this, uh, and we, for that conversation with the stakeholder and the people that will be our customers, they'll further tell us what they want, they will describe it and all of that. Let's say they are describing things that we've never heard of. And then be like, oh, I'm not familiar with that. Let's further do a little bit more analysis. Uh, and investigate for that to understand if these people truly mean they want a marker or they want a pen or what is the outcome from having a marker over having a pen, you know. And in that sprint, they will now create a, a, a spike and do that research, right? And let's say that they already decided that they want, they want a marker. Let's say that they already, after through conversation with the stakeholder, with the end user and the team doing our research and analysis, they, further, they already further understand what needed to be built and now we already agree and now we are ready to move into development stage. And before that, we have to create the environmental setup. In this marker case, before we can actually write on this marker, we first need this back, right? This back first to be created before we can able to hold it and write on it. So this environmental setup behind, right? This back of the pen, this marker, I mean, I can call it a pen. <laughs> this back of the marker, we first have to be created, right? before we can able to write because we can just hold the ink and write right we don't, nobody does that we all use that so that environmental setup and that architectural setup and they also sometimes to do with architectural design and everything all those two takes work for the team to do so that's the enabler uh, and the functional part is us able to write right us able to write on it then the customer can able to write on it and see that oh yes now i'm happy i'm able to write on this story you know, that's just a simple example. People also sometimes use example of a house. You first of all will build the foundation, right? You'll get your diagram set up on how you want to build your house. And all those foundational stuff, we don't see it. But without that, the house cannot stand, right? Those are all like different building set, uh, set up. So just for you to know that when it comes to spike, when it comes to enablers, when it comes to functional story, uh, the question I've sometimes been asked, asked is that do invest criteria also applies to all of this, right? Does inverse criteria also apply? The answer is yes, right? Inverse criteria also apply. Acceptance criteria also applies when you're writing a spike or when you are uh, creating an enabler and a functional story. I know a lot of people will come to me like, oh, Aisha, what do you mean for a spike? How can we have an acceptance criteria on a spike? But to be honest, it's good to have to follow the inverse criteria even with a spike because you don't want to create a spike that will be so big that it can be completed within a sprint, right? At all times, we also want to ensure that the invest criteria also applies where the spike will be small enough 
to be completed in a particular sprint. And the reason why it's so important to have an acceptance criteria so we can have something to look back to to validate on when it comes to at the end of it, what did we achieve? We can't just say, oh, I just want to do a research that if I, if I can um, able to log in on this site or able to create this new functionality, right? Because that's broad, that's huge. But if they can be more specific uh, on what they want to do and what they want to assess or uh, what is the kind of assumption they have, and at the end of it, and create some kind of assumption that can be around the acceptance criteria. Of course, at the end of it, it won't be like a functional thing, but it will be where they will base their understanding around so that when it comes to validating, so the team can know, hmm, we had the assumption that this red pen uh, can only be red. They can't write anything else but red. Oh, was that right? Were we valid with that based on our analysis and the knowledge we've gained so far? Is this right? You know, so that's why we put acceptance criteria just to help us very validate and also may get us to focus, right? Because sometimes I've seen a team that they'll be having one spike, they'll have that spike for like multiple sprints that one spike. That's not a good practice, right? Always important to create your spike, make it small, and also ensure that it's something that can be completed within a sprint. Very, very important. And also, uh, when it comes to writing this, the format, I know like you all already know for the functional stories, we're always going to write it by the who, what, and why, and the acceptance criteria is the same thing for the enablers. It is true. People are like, oh, since we don't have an uh, end user in this particular case, who will be, who will be uh, the, the user for an enabler? The user will basically, basically be the, uh, the, the technical sites, like the architectural settings, you know. Uh, as an architectural uh, uh, user, I would like to have this wireframe set up so that I can be able to build it. You know, that can be some kind of example. You know, the same thing with Spike, based on what you have, what you, why you're doing it, you can also use some of those assumptions as your user. Uh, some mistake I've also seen is that people will basically in those Spike or enablers, they will make it the user as the developer developing it or as the PO that created the story or sometimes, you know, or the BA that created the story. The user should never be the PO, the BA, the Scrum Master. The user should always be like, why are you doing it? You know, that can sometimes help you come around with who is going to be the user. I hope this different uh, small scenario example on the difference between a spike and enabler and functional story will be valuable for you all. If so, like and subscribe to this channel. I really, really appreciate you all. Thank you all for watching and see you all again in my next video.